I am Rachel Romeliotis, a senior editor at O'Reilly Media, and I am with Josh Marinacci. He is a speaker at uh, OzCon 2013, and we're going to talk about Internet of Things and the laws of robotics. Yes. Uh, so, just for to make sure everybody's on the same page, what is the Internet of Things? You know, that's a question I've been pondering a lot uh, for this talk, and it's really... There's different ways of defining it, and it's kind of a squishy topic. My vision is that it's sort of an ideal, which we will keep getting closer towards, where computation is a part of our lives, but it also is so integrated and so well designed that it sort of fades away. So imagine you know, your house of the Jetsons, where there's your smart toaster, and your smart door, and your smart lights, but you don't think of them as just being smart anymore, because you don't have to press buttons or turn dials. They just do what you want. So it's almost more like I don't know, like a magic house in Harry Potter, maybe, where the house just knows what the right thing to do is and hopefully does it with your best interest in mind. So tell me some examples of sort of what we're seeing now, both good and bad. Right now, pretty much we're taking anything that has electricity already and trying to put some smarts into it. So your smart light bulbs or smart lamps. Uh, there's some attempts at smart dishwashers and washing machines. Um, but it, it is more than just sticking an Ethernet cable into it. Right. You know, it needs to be, um, it has to do something, it has to make your life easier, ultimately. Which hopefully it can do by collaborating with the other things in your house. So if it knows, if the thermostat knows the temperature, it turns on the AC, right? We already have that. Well, can we apply that to other areas? Like, um, could it automatically close the windows and turn on the AC, or vice versa? Because <laughs> where I live, it gets cold at night, and I would love it if my windows were just open at 10, because that's when it needs to. Right. Or if my garage door was still open at 10, then it would send me a text message saying, by the way, you left your garage door open, because I do that all the time. That's act that would actually be a great idea. Yeah. So do you see any problems with the, the, the network being so pervasive? Well, yes, but I got to think it's a technology it can be used for good or for evil. Sure. Um, fortunately, here we have lots of people trying to do good things with it. But right. yeah, it's a it's a risk, um, and it, it's a more of a risk than bringing water and electricity into your house because it is intelligent and it allows people who are very far away to maybe attack you or spy on you. you know, that's here in the U.S. at least, that's been a big issue uh, the last few weeks with the NSA revelations. Right. Um, and so it really calls into question what what is privacy, where does personal property end and public property begin? Uh, does that does geography and physical location even matter when we have networks and you can do anything from anywhere in the world? Interesting. So it's, I, I'm afraid I don't have answers for these, but... Um, no, that's okay. <laughs> I think it's an evolving issue. They're, they're good questions that we're going we're gonna to have to answer in some sense uh, over the next 10 years as right. we build out this Internet of Things. So now you did a talk on the Internet of Things and the three laws of robotics. Yes. Tell me a little bit about that because I think that's fascinating. So um, a lot of people know Isaac Asimov primarily because he had gigantic mutton shop uh, sideburns. <laughs> which were horrifying, and he wrote these incredible science fiction stories, yes. as well as nonfiction and being a part of the space race and everything. Um, and he was tired of reading classic horror science fiction stories, which were really the same genre back then. Horror and sci-fi were one and the same. That were basically variations on Frankenstein's monster. Man creates some sort of thing, and through our hubris, because we're trying to play God, the thing turns evil and destroys us, right? Mm -hmm. And there are many variations, but they're the same thing. And sure. he said, that's stupid. Why would you make something like that? Why wouldn't you instill it with some, even if just rudimentary, sense of ethics and morality? You know, if we're going to be God, then we should be good at it. So he came up with these three laws, which were that the robots can't harm a human, that the robot must always do what humans tell it to do, it is subservient, unless that would violate the first rule because there's a priority, right. and the robot should always protect its own existence unless that would violate the previous two rules. Right. And all of his stories were around interesting interactions of the laws, or if you, took, if you bent the law in a weird way, the robot misunderstood you, what would happen? Mm -hmm. So that's where the interesting stories came from. But I think it's a really good ethical framework, not just for robots, but for the Internet of Things, since ultimately most of these are essentially robots. They're right. semi-intelligent. They, 
they might not necessarily move from their spot, but they are doing things on our behalf, or at least we hope on our behalf, and so we better build in a system of ethics. And, I mean, that's a tried and true system. He's, he was talking about it for 50 years. Yep. We have lots of great stories. I think it's a good basis. I find that fascinating. I think it'll be interesting to see what does happen. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks. I had a good time.